Hello and welcome to session four of the AIM North America series on FISMA 204. Today we'll be discussing critical tracking event capture and data sharing. I'm Mike Allen, the Business Development Director of AIM. And before I introduce you to our other panelists, there are a few housekeeping notes I'll be going over. First, you are muted during the conversation, but please feel free to participate and ask questions you have. You can do so by using the chat option at the bottom of the application screen. And we'll get to as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar. Also, a recording will be made available and all registrants will be notified when that is uploaded. AIM North America has an antitrust policy that states that operations and are conducted in strict compliance with the antitrust laws. No AIM activities shall create even the appearance of a violation of the letter or spirit of the antitrust laws. And here's GS1 US legal disclosure. Please take a moment to review that. And AIM North America webinars are held for the primary purpose of advancements in our industry, which necessarily involves development of work product intended solely for the public domain. AIM's developed this policy for the protection of its members who engage in this important collaborative effort. Again, I'm Mike Allen, the Business Development Director for AIM, and I'm joined today by Lucy Angerita, the Director of Community Engagement for GS1 US, and Steve Keddy, the Senior Director of AIDC for GS1 Global. So if you've been following our series, we've been showing the countdown to November 7th. We're now down to just 32 days before the expected publication. The agenda for today's webinar is on the screen now. I'll give an overview of FISMA 204, and then we'll get into GS1 standards for traceability, data capture and sharing, and then some next steps with this information. I do wanna thank Julie McGill from Food Logic, who helped with development of this webinar and actually came up with the slides I'm going over today. Julie cannot be on today's call and sends her regards. And again, I wanna thank her for providing us this very useful information. So let's get started. The products that need to be tracked are listed on the FDA's food traceability list to determine which foods should be included. The FDA developed a risk ranking model based on the factors that were identified in section 204 of FISMA. In the proposed rule, products may be added or deleted from this list. If added, companies will have 12 months to be compliant with enhanced traceability record keeping. If removed, companies can stop immediately. This rule applies to all companies who manufacture, process, pack, or hold foods on the food traceability list. Next, I'd like to talk about the data attributes and when to collect information. First, the FDA reviewed existing industry standards, initiatives, and current approaches, such as the Product Traceability Initiative and GS1 US Grocery and Food Service Initiatives. We were happy to see that the FDA harmonized their approach and utilized some of their best practices and language from that industry work. In the proposed rule, they outline key data elements. This is the data you need to collect for the different activities in your supply chain. This will vary based on event type. And then critical tracking events are those activities that occur in supply chains. In this graphic from the FDA, you can see the different CTEs that are required for each role, such as shipping and receiving. And finally, be aware of your role or roles. Trading partners will be responsible for capturing critical tracking events that occur in their step of the supply chain. And what are those data attributes? Here we've broken down the data into different categories. The proposed rule outlines different CTEs or activities, and each of them have product, location, and even a data behind them. There are also some new data requirements, such as first receiver, that the industry is waiting for more clarification on. We should see that in the final rule. And with that, I'll let Steve take over the conversation and start by telling us some more about who GS1 is. Steve, take it away. Thanks very much, Mike. So just quickly, Steve Keddy from GS1 Global Office. Uh, I lead the subject matter expert team. And what I'll be doing as part of this presentation is just giving you the, a high level look at what standards will be uh, important to know with regards to FISMA 204. So let's quickly start to, uh, with who's GS1 is. Well, GS1 is a neutral organization and we're actually globally uh, a, a, a really a global uh, platform for industry to come together. Uh, and not only just industry, we have uh, governments, uh, regulators, academia, and other associations, and really to come together to decide on what standards will make uh, things are interoperable. At the end of the day, uh, we don't do any work unless uh, industry is asking for it. We've been um, best known really around the fact that we have 16 billion transactions happening every day. And we're mostly known for 
the uh, the UPC and EAN barcodes that are everywhere on every product, but we're much more than that. Uh, and we'll get into uh, the whole system and how that system actually enables industry to move forward. GS1 is actually a federation uh, with myself being a global office and we have 116 member organizations. And the idea is that we all come together, determine a global standard, and then the member organizations in those individual countries help the, their members to actually implement and, and if necessary, uh, make subtle changes to make sure that they meet their local regulations and, and, and items like that. But if you want to move forward. So why, are, why is it important to have uh, standards in common language? Well, my wife always likes to put it this way. Um, when we go on holidays, she uh, invariably ends up having wet hair. And so the problem is if you don't have standards, you end up with a, a non-interoperability between things. So you can't plug your hair dryer into the location you're at. So the idea behind having the global standards is to help industry to be more efficient and create that interoperability across uh, platforms, across countries, so that we can all uh, take uh, part in that those efficiencies. Go ahead. Oh, next slide. There we go. So uh, GS1 is really built uh, a system around three pillars. The, the, the major pillar is the identification. So it's important to have unique identification of things. And those things could be a product, they could be a location, they could be a document. And the idea behind it is to make sure that you have that unique identification of that product. So then it can then be uh, relayed uh, throughout, the, throughout the system. The next layer is what we call our data capture layer. And these are the uh, ideas around taking that data and putting it into an AIDC carrier so that that information can be automatically scanned. And then that information can then go into the system uh, without any human intervention and, and uh, keep things nice and clean. And once you've got that uh, uh, information into the system, we move into our share layer. And this is a layer where you have master data, transactional data, and physical event data that all go back to the original uh, keys and, and attributes that may have been added along the way to help qualify those keys. Go ahead. So next. Right, there it is. Good, thank you. My, my side's a little slower. So if I, if I break it down a little bit more and look at uh, the uh, how identify, capture, and share really connects well to FISMA 204. In the identify side, we've got the G10, which would be going on the, uh, the actual product. You have the uh, serialized shipping container code that would be part of pallets. And then you have location data as the product moves along. And on the capture side, the barcodes that we'd be using, uh, for example, are GS128. Uh, 2D barcodes or even RFID tags. And then on the share layer, we've got the product uh, data exchange, which is which we call the global data centralization network. We've got the location exchange, which is around data hub locations. And finally, we have the very important event data sharing exchange, which is around uh, EDI and uh, EPCIS. Next. So it's really important, as I said, to have that unique identification. That's the key to driving the, the system all the way through. So the G10 is really identifying the, the trade item and the SSC is really being used to uh, identify uh, the next layer up of those trade items. So those trade items get put into cases, the cases then get put uh, onto pallets, and then that SSCC uh, is used to track uh, as it goes through shipments. And then the last layer is around the location, the GLN. And so knowing where those products are as it flows through the system is, the, is really what uh, helps us with the identification. And next. Next, we get into uh, a little bit deeper dive into uh, the data carriers that are part of the uh, data capture. So everybody's really well familiar with the UPC EANs uh, that are on every product in the world that goes through uh, retail. But, uh, but with FISMA, you, the, those aren't uh, enough. Now we need additional data. So next, 
so these uh, linear barcodes are the ones that are used currently in open standards. Um, you have the data bar family expanded and expanded stack can have additional data and often uh, those that are dealing with cases and things of like that recognize GS128 where you can have an example here where you have the expiry date and lot information that is actually uh, connected with that DGEN. But next, but now we're moving into uh, a new generation. GS1's already started down a path of, of uh, enabling 2D at retail. And the three barcodes that, uh, three 2D barcodes that I've uh, circled there are already part of uh, that transition where we have a GS1 data matrix, which carries the data exactly the same as a GS128 would, and a newer uh, uh, technology and encoding called uh, GS1 digital link URI syntax. Uh, but not to forget, uh, also part of that family is the EPC tags, which uh, allow you to uh, not have to have a line of sight to the product to know what's going on. But all of those today would still need to have uh, the related 1D barcode to make sure you have complete interoperability throughout the system. Next. So now we're gonna dive a little bit deeper before I hand, hand over. Uh, on the data exchange side, you have the data data, uh, sorry, the global data synchronization network, which really at the end of the day is the master data, where you have the, the GTANs, the brand identification, product descriptions, and product classifications. And then at the next layer, you're really now dealing with transactional data where uh, you're using the electronic data exchange, which is EDI. And here, again, the G10, GLN, and GS GSCN move forward uh, as part of the, the core identification. But now you're into purchase orders, electronic purchase orders, invoices, pay and electronic payments. But most important to uh, FISMA 204 is the advanced shipping notices. And then finally, you have the one that actually deals with the uh, actual event data, which is EPCIS. And so within EPIS, EPCIS, you really have uh, four and now a fifth uh, important uh, factors. You have the what, which is the, the G10 or the product, the where, which is the GLN, and then you have time and date stamps, and you have a why, which is related to the business step, and maybe it's a, tr uh, a transformation on a production line, or maybe it's a, a movement into a, a carrier. And now we've added with uh, EPCS 2.0, the how. So now uh, we can also include, uh, for example, on uh, RFID tags, you can add, add sensor data, and that sensor data can now be part of that transmission with regards to EPCIS. And now I'm gonna hand it over to, Lucy, who's going to do a much more deep dive and give you a good example. So off to you, Lucy. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so yes, just everything that Steve just described is actually building up to what a GS1 US is doing um, to help companies understand how the standards can uh, assist in complying with FISMA 204. So a lot of us, when we think about the FISMA 204 proposed rule, we feel like this guy here in this picture, a little bit overwhelmed. Now, the good news is that today, a lot of companies are actually exchanging a lot of this data that's um, so far uh, being required as part of the proposed rules. So uh, our members came to us saying, we wanna be proactive, even if the rule is not final, we wanna know what gaps we have in our systems. Um, what, what do we need to add or what are we already doing? Um, so what Steve described, basically everything, the core of everything starts with the GS1 identification keys. Many companies today use GTINs, global trade item numbers, GLNs, global location numbers, um, SSCCs, uh, serial shipping container codes, and all of these identification keys to be able to be interoperable. And, and share their supply chain data today to manage their, their systems. Um, so now, you know, we need to take what the FDA is requiring, all these different uh, KDEs and CTEs, they're the critical um, uh, tracking events and key data elements that they're requiring and saying, is there a standard for that today? Right, and where is that gap? So this is exactly um, what we are focusing on doing. And I will give two more examples in the next slide. 
of how standards can be applied to meet the proposed rule. So we talk about, okay, companies need to pass what they're shipping, right, to one another. It's one of the aspects of, of the proposed rule that everybody is focusing on. Well, for years, people have been using advanced ship notices, ASNs. Right. Um, some companies uh, use serial shipping container codes, which is the number that identifies a pallet. And not only that, they put they turn it into a barcode. So they put a GS1128 barcode on a pallet and then they associate that specific SSEC in their advanced ship notice. And today there is already a, a solution to share how many GTINs, how many lock codes of each of the cases that are in that pallet electronically with the recipient of this pallet. So then they all they need to do is scan the serial shipping container code and all this information is going to be married in their system. If you have any questions, I'm, I'm going slow, but please feel free to put it in the chat and we will definitely address that um, at the end of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the discussion. So moving right along, the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Stephen was um, describing as EPCIS, Electronic Product Code Information Systems, so uh, information services. So one of the things that um, people have been thinking about, okay, so if we have a ready-to-eat salad, um, how can we make sure we understand or we can capture what information, what lock codes go into this ready-to-eat salad, and then what lock code I created to ship out of my system? Um, so here we have a made up name of a salad with a, with a supplier made up name. And we have kale, we have feta, we have butternut squash, we have red onions going in there with a GTIN and a lock code that are of course different. Next slide. So the EPCIS, Electronic Product Code Information Services language allows us to take this information as the product is getting transformed all these ingredients going into this one salad and uh, with using that same language we are actually um, getting the the different pieces of the puzzle together to actually be able to not only capture ourselves but understand what's coming out what went in and what's coming out um, now we're not saying as as an industry group we're not saying everybody needs to adopt this that specific epcis technology but what we are doing is we're trying to agree these are the attributes that we need to share these are the different formats that these attributes need to have if you have that app as the foundation you can share this data in any way that your company needs to using a third-party provider using your own systems using um, I don't want to say a spreadsheet but yes that is a possibility and all of us can do that by having all those attributes and formats defined next so now I want to walk all of you through a real um, example. And I know uh, the, the, the case study owner of, of this is actually in, in the call today. So thank you for sharing all of your learnings. This is a real uh, example that you can find at gs1us.org in our case studies. Many food companies have already been implementing traceability programs for several years, actually. And this is the way it works, a distributor right? They place an order with a manufacturer. The second I can hear, it says, well, as the product is getting uh, uh, packed in the manufacturing plant, a GS1128 barcode label is applied to every single case of that product. Now, as cases are getting assembled into pallets, there is a serial shipping container code put into a barcode, into a GS1128 barcode, so it can identify that pallet. Once that pallet gets broken down, that SSCC no longer is valid. But as it moves, it is the one uh, number that identifies that logistics unit. Next slide. Uh, so now the ASN in this uh, particular uh, step is sent out to that distribution center who has hopefully not received that product physically, right? So this ASN comes into their systems. And when that product arrives physically, that pallet, all they have to do is scan that GS1128 barcode, that ASN gets um, 
connected to that palette and everything in that ASN, including GTINs, lots, everything that's specific to that palette gets confirmed. Okay, now I have it. And after that, when the DC actually breaks down this palette, they no longer have that SSCC, right? Because that's what identified the palette. Now they have the individual GTINs, the global trade item numbers, plus the lots, the dates, or whatever other information they're including in that case barcode label. And when they deliver it to the restaurants, they can scan it in each of the restaurants or in each of the retail grocery um, establishments. With that, if, if your store, if your restaurant has that capability, next slide, you can actually um, have the full picture. So as that case is scanned at the retail store, at the res restaurant establishment, you, ha you have the movement. This was a case that became a pallet in this manufacturing plant identified with a global location number. Then it went to this distribution center identified with this global location number. Then it went, it, it got broken down and it got delivered to a store or a restaurant. And it's this individual case that now is at this store with this lot code. Now, here's a, a true story of what happened with this um, implementation. The, this, is, uh, this story belongs to an operator, so um, they were alerted, and um, nine cases of, of bread was high risk, and they had to do um, a quick recall, but it had gone to 700 different locations. So imagine trying to find a needle in a haystack, right? That's kind of what was happening, but Fortunately, those distribution centers had already started scanning that product. And immediately, they were able to find four cases of product within seconds, right? And then you would say, oh, but what about the other five? Well, not everybody was scanning every single case, right? So what happened was uh, uh, the, the operator was able to look at similar times where that product was delivered in nearby locations. Phone calls were made, and within two hours, those nine cases of product were retrieved. So if you think about it, 700 different locations trying to find nine, uh, nine cases of product would have taken a long time. And we all know that. Everybody that's that's involved in the recall, especially on Fridays, no. Any day, it takes, it, it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort. And with this, you know, even if it wasn't complete, 100% perfect, it went down to two hours. Next. So what are we doing as GS1 US to support our, our members? As I had mentioned, they came, they're like, we wanna be um, proactive. We know the rule is not final, so we're getting ready to tweak it with any changes that come through this month. But to date, right, this, this work group actually was formed back in November of last year. We've been working on this for about a year. We have about 99 participants of um, 57 different companies right now food service, retail grocery solution providers, all coming together to address these challenges, to talk about it. We just had a meeting, um, a face-to-face -face meeting, and it was so fun to see people saying, well, it's so good to not be alone in this. We know there are similar companies that have similar um, challenges, and we're all here together to solve it uh, in a way that helps us all, because if we're not all doing this the same way, we're, we're, it's going to be very hard to get there. Um, so we invite you to participate in this work group. Just my contact information will be out there, um, Director of Community Engagement. You can always um, look me up on LinkedIn also, and I will uh, put you in touch with the correct people to join our work group, uh, because it, this is definitely an industry effort uh, where everybody can benefit. And with that, um, I'll turn it over to Mike again. Yeah, so just some next steps. Uh, again, the final rule is going to be published on November 7th. Uh, the compliance is for January 2025. And then uh, we're just asking that you collaborate with your trading partners and industry associations to you know, be familiar with the rules and to participate in industry association and GS1 discussions uh, so that we can move this forward. So I uh, just wanted to quickly put up the GS1 US trademark notices. And then uh, we have some time for questions or comments, uh, Steve and uh, Lucy, if you're ready. Yeah, I, I We're answered, ready. Yeah, Go I answered, ahead, Steve. No, no, I've answered the first question already. Um, 
it, it says an honest attendee, so I'm not sure who it went to. But their second question was interesting, and I wasn't necessarily in the room. I have a idea of why it was uh, from conversations, but I don't know if uh, Lucy or someone else was in the room. Yeah. But the second question was uh, based on the historical success of the DS CSA. Uh, what was the reason for not directing uh, for the FISMA 204 for not directing to use uh, the GS1 system? basically. Yeah, that is for the FDA to um, yeah, answer, that was your probably. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We will keep that up as a question, as a follow-up question for them, hopefully. That was going to be my answer, but I thought maybe if somebody was in the room. <laughs> so, so I think for Phone me- a friend. No, we don't have a friend right now. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I know that um, uh, Abdullah actually had their hand up, and uh, but maybe they wanted to come off for, uh, off mute first before we answer Carlos Carlos's question. Okay, Abdullah, you can speak if you'd like. Yeah, you have the you should have the ability to unmute now. Hello, you're in. Yes. Hi, how, how are you? How is everyone? Good, Great. thank you. Actually, Great. actually I, I'm from Saudi Arabia. I'm just wondering what about the uh, exporter and importers? Is there any rules apply if I going to send anything to America? What happened to me? There are um, certain numbers and things that you need to um, make sure you maintain when you are importing a, a product. Um, but yes, I think right now what we're focusing on is how these standards can get implemented for, for um, US members. And that, yes, of course, includes if you're importing products. So uh, you can become part of the discussion. Um, we have not addressed uh, global companies that, you know, that, for example, that live in other, um, in other countries right now. But we, that is a plan for the future. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, did you want me to read the next one, Mike? Or you can I can. It? Yeah, if you. Oh, go if ahead. You'd like. Mike. Yeah. No, oh, sure. And then, so the next question that came in from Carlos is for stores and restaurants, and this is right down uh, Lucy's uh, wheelhouse here. For stores and restaurants to be able to scan GS one one twenty one twenty eight, does the warehouse need to send the ASN? That's the first part of the question. If so, uh, how? So if so, how uh, a multi-client warehouse, how can a multi-client warehouse manage different ASN types based on the client customer requirements? So this specific example um, that I shared in real life was not with the ASN getting sent to the restaurant specifically. This was just as the cases were getting delivered, that GS1128 on the case was um, scanned and all that data of the scanned uh, deliveries was sent out to that operator. So this specific example did not have, have an ASN. It is very common in food service not to have full pallets of product getting delivered to restaurants. But when it comes to stores, that could be very useful. I don't know, Stephen, if you want yeah. to no, I was, elaborate. I was, on, I was on the same path because um, um, coming into the uh, individual restaurant or, or um, usually the uh, the pallet has been um, separated and now cases are moving forward and on those indiv individual cases you'll have the the GS128 that then creates that uh, that connection when it arrives at the store so exactly how I see it as well Lucy perfect thank you any other questions any other questions yeah. from our audience all right well Lucy and Steve, uh, greatly appreciate. Oh, <laughs> we just got one in. Do you think that the two-year period will be enough to comply for all partners? I'll let Stephen answer that. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you go first. There's there's a lot of um, concern around this, and but again, you know what what we have been seeing in in food is this is not something that people are just. Um, seeing right now it's it's been happening for uh, for several years so a lot of people are like ahead of it a lot of people are behind so it is uh you know two years uh, a, a point of 
common concern for, for a lot of companies. Yeah, I think the way I would add on to that is um, there's there's uh, members uh, of the GS1 system that are in fresh, in ultra fresh, and in shelf stable that are already capable. And so for them to be compliant, uh, it's uh, um, it, it's almost like turning on a switch, and they're compliant. But uh, there's uh, others that um, they may be still members of GS1, but they're just they're just utilizing the keys at this point and some other things. But now moving in and now uh, uh, adding the additional functionality around the share layer is the the next and the, probably the most important step for them. Yes, that's definitely true, and and it is getting more granular. So. Mm -hmm. Um, this is this is something companies are definitely looking into. The good thing is that it, it is driving focus for partners to align on what they need to do, which is um, very key for everybody to to be able to achieve that goal. Great. And thank you again, uh, Lucy and Steve, for your time and insights today. So greatly appreciated. I have the AIM North America contact us slide here. Just a thanks to our audience for their active participation today. Uh, and just, you know, some trademark notices here and the legal disclosure as well. So uh, thank you again, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.